Recently, This Is America visited the Republic of Kazakhstan in Central Asia. Kazakhstan is one of the 15 countries which were formed by the breakup of the Soviet Union, and it's the most successful of them all. On December 16th, Kazakhstan celebrates its 20th anniversary of independence. It's the ninth largest country in the world, and its location, oil and mineral wealth, and government's vision have all contributed to its rapid growth. Internationally, Kazakhstan is a world leader in the goal of eradicating nuclear weapons on Earth. It's a beautiful country of snow-capped mountains, vast steppe regions and deserts, and both historic and futuristic cities. With a population of 16 and a half million people, Kazakhstan is home to more than 100 different ethnic groups, resulting in an incredibly rich and diverse culture. Over the next few programs, This Is America will take a look at the culture, people, government, economy, and sites of Kazakhstan. We'll also take a look at the importance of Kazakhstan in the region and its relationship with the United States. This Is America visits the Republic of Kazakhstan. This Is America is made possible by the National Education Association, the nation's largest advocate for children and public education. The American Federation of Teachers, a union of professionals. The Singapore Tourism Board, there's something for everyone. Singapore Airlines, a great way to fly. Poonsan Corporation, forging a higher global standard. The CTC Foundation, AFO Communications, and the Rotondaro Family Trust. Later, I'll talk with Kazakhstan's foreign minister. Right now, a visit with U.S. ambassador to Kazakhstan, Kenneth Fairfax. What should Americans know about Kazakhstan? I think the short answer is a lot more than they currently do. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you know, it's the ninth largest country on Earth. Um, it's a country that has uh, rather extraordinary relations with the United States. And yet most people really know either nothing or worse than nothing, what they've seen in a movie, which uh, is the opposite of reality, of course. And so there's a lot to learn here. What are the mutual interests of the two countries, the United States and Kazakhstan? We have many. Uh, you can look at it from energy to food security. We have lots of overlapping interests. But I think the one that for many people will come to mind first is on nonproliferation and world security. Kazakhstan, after the fall of the Soviet Union, became the world's fourth largest nuclear weapon state. Mm -hmm. And the first one to decide, we don't want it. Um, President Nazarbayev declared that they were going to be a non-nuclear weapon state and negotiated with the United States and Russia to dismantle all the weapons and to then take what remained of them, the uranium and other components that remain dangerous and reduce those to a non-dangerous state. And so that was a, uh, a really historic decision and in fact followed off on an earlier one, which was 20 years ago. Uh, Nazarbayev also closed the Semipalatinsk uh, nuclear weapons testing site, the largest nuclear weapons testing site in the world, more than 450 explosions. And he actually did that before uh, Kazakhstan officially became independent. It was this sort of decision saying, enough is enough, I hereby decree this place is closed. And it's been closed ever since. Mm -hmm. So really one of the things that you're saying, and uh, the history is fascinating because uh, just backing up a little bit, Kazakhstan was kind of like a state within the Soviet Union, huh? so that people can kind of grab a hold of that. Uh, but he made a very, the president, current president made a very, very uh, bold uh, uh, statement to the world by saying this place is closed, huh? He made a very bold statement by saying 
the testing grounds is closed. He mm -hmm. made another one by saying no more nuclear weapons. We have them. We don't want them. But then he did other early things as well. For example, Kazakhstan has always had a lot of oil, mm -hmm. but it's been oil in the ground and not developed. And it really didn't help the Kazakh people much at all during the Soviet Union. And so shortly after the Kazakhstan became independent, there was a international call saying, all right, let's work with the best international companies. Let's develop the oil for the benefit of the country. And so you end up with the American company Chevron coming in very early on to develop um, a large oil field hill. Mm -hmm. And that uh, process of sort of inviting in foreign investors was very early. This mm -hmm. was uh, a difficult, unsettled period around much of the former Soviet Union, but Kazakhstan sort of stepped out in front fast and said, we're gonna take a different route and we're gonna be more open. So in addition to the, uh, the nuclear non-proliferation piece, we now have a, a country that is not only vast in size, as you mentioned, but now is really oil rich, huh? It is. It has the potential to become one of the 10 largest oil producers in the world. Mm -hmm. What do you make of the, um, the people here, the, uh, the culture? Talk a little bit about that. I know uh, that this is a new posting for you, but uh, you're experienced in this part of the world. The Kazakh people are a really interesting and gracious people, and they're very hard to pigeonhole. You know, people will look at the region and say, oh, it's Central Asia. Well, it is, that's a geographic term, but culturally it's different. You know, the, the Kazakh culture goes all the way back to the days of the nomads. You know, Americans, everybody's heard of Genghis Khan, for example. This is all part of that ancient culture. The nomadic culture continued for a very long time, and while today it's no longer exists, you know, pretty much everybody is settled these days, it still impacts the thinking. You mm -hmm. know, the, in a nomadic culture, the family moves as a unit, there's a heavy emphasis on relations and on community, and all that continues. Um, and that, it gives a unique uh, aspect. The country, uh, so vast, as you said, uh, some of our readings said it's kind of uh, as, uh, four times as big as Texas and uh, kind of as big as Western Europe or something like that. Um, it's a kind of a tough neighborhood, isn't it, though? There's a, there's a lot going on in this area. Central Asia has been a tough neighborhood for a long time. Um, this is, you know, since the end of the Soviet Union and the breakup, it's been a tough neighborhood. But even before that, you go back to there was a period where they referred to the Great Game. Um, and it was mainly not in Kazakhstan, it was in the neighbors, but it was a tough neighborhood then. And you can go all the way back, you know, to 300 BC with the adventures of uh, Alexander the Great, that this was a tough neighborhood even then. So, uh, so for folks who are just watching our conversation, might not have a map right in front of them, uh, just uh, kind of uh, in your mind's eye, describe uh, some of the countries uh, in the area. Well the bordering countries and so on and so forth. Kazakhstan is sort of this large country. It would look enormous if it wasn't for the fact that right next door to it you have <laughs> Russia to the north, which is, of course is the biggest thing on earth, and China uh, to the east. And so it's got those two big ones, but yet within there you've got Kazakhstan, and then around the edges you've got Kyrgyzstan, uh, Uzbekistan, or the two on the sides, and then uh, Tajikistan and Turkmenistan, and those are the five countries that make up what geographers refer to as Central Asia. Mm -hmm. Move down just below them and you down into Afghanistan, Pakistan, and then from there on down into the subcontinent. Mm -hmm. uh, for the folks at home as well, uh, but also to help my education, when all of these countries were named Stan, does the Stan part have a, have a reference there? Or Stan is literally country. Is country, okay. Just like Astana, is literally capital in, in, uh, in Kazakh. In Kazakh. Uh, heading toward the finish line, this is the 20th anniversary of the independence. And it's amazing to think that the culture goes back thousands of years. Mm -hmm. Then you jump forward and you say 50 years ago, part of the Soviet Union, and now 20 years ago, independence. How do you see the future of Kazakhstan? Well, Kazakhstan is very much a place that's still writing its own future, so nobody can really predict where it's going. They've made commitments. Uh, last year, you probably know, they were the head of the Organization of Security and Cooperation in Europe, the OSCE, 
and they made a long-term vision for a country that is very much a, uh, a Western country, I guess you would say, in the sort of uh, democratic and human rights values. Now, that's not something that's going to happen overnight. And so over the next five, ten years into the future, this country will continue to remake itself. It's gone from a poor and impoverished country, Soviet country, to a modern, growing one. And where it goes next is really up to the Kazakh people. And it's a constant process. And it's, you know, the United States, all countries change. But the pace of change here mm -hmm. is really something different. Mm -hmm. I mean, they've independence to today in the same 200 years that the United States took, but you know, here it's only 20. Mm. I know this is a new posting for you. Uh, congratulations on being confirmed by the Senate back home. Uh, what do you see as your mission? Well, my mission in every country I serve in is really to try to implement U.S. policy on a broad basis. And in Kazakhstan, we do have broad sets of uh, interest and relations that go from nonproliferation and nuclear issues, as we said, non uh, civilian uses of nuclear power. Kazakhstan is mm -hmm. now the world's largest exporter of uranium. It's the world's fifth largest exporter of uh, grains and wheat. And so it's a food security issue, which is really important uh, right now in the world due to all the droughts. We have military relationships with them, including uh, relations that are now helping to supply our troops in Afghanistan. Regional issues, everything from trafficking in persons to drug trafficking. Um, we simply cooperate on pretty much the whole range of issues that you would expect we would have with a major country, which Kazakhstan is. Mm -hmm. It's really becoming so much more of our neighbor. The big one that we're working on now is WTO accession. Uh, and Kazakhstan has not yet become part of the world trading order, but they want to. They want to become uh, an actor on the world stage that behaves by the same rules and works in the same way that everyone else does. And, this means our relations span everything. Is there any competition between uh, trying to get involved in the WTO and this uh, common union that's happening between uh, Russia, Belarus, Kazakhstan? Well, the short answer is no, not really. Mm -hmm. um, there's, a, there's a really complex answer. There's a way in which uh, union agreements like that can be incorporated into WTO. It's called a Section 28 process where you modify people's uh, agreements and go through it. But in the end, it'll be more negotiating and more paperwork, but it's not incompatible. And it's all in the interest of trade, right? It's all in the interest of facilitating trade so that countries like Kazakhstan can export goods more freely around the world and that other countries have the same rights in exporting to Kazakhstan. Mm. It's exciting to be here. We're thrilled to have the opportunity to talk with you, Ambassador. Thank well, you. Thank you, so you very much. much. Thank you. After our conversation at the U.S. Embassy with Ambassador Fairfax, we visited the Foreign Ministry of Kazakhstan. What, what would you say are the pillars of the uh, foreign policy of Kazakhstan? Well, the, you know that uh, after gaining independence in 1991, we uh, became a full-fledged members of the United Nations as a peace-loving nation and uh, uh, our foreign policy based on the purposes and principles of the United Nations Charter. In 1994 we joined the NPT as a non-nuclear state and in 1995 together with the United States, with the cooperation uh, extended from the United States uh, we managed to get rid of the nuclear arsenals that uh, are being stored uh, in, in Kazakhstan. The government put emphasis on the economic development and uh, we managed to attract over the period of 20 years uh, an amount of investments of $150 billion. So what we are saying, what the message is being sent to the rest of the world, instead of keeping nuclear weaponry and being a uh, a nuclear state that is out of law and that is uh, that is not uh, uh, playing a serious role in this in this uh, environment. So, by getting rid of the uh, nuclear weaponry, we managed to uh, completely reverse the trend of the country, and we managed to attract the economic potential of our country by attracting this 
much amount of investments from abroad. And uh, frankly speaking, in this region, in Central Asia, 80% of investments coming to Kazakhstan. The economic development the, uh, was primarily aimed to upgrade the standards of living of the people. Speaking about the foreign policy, what I would like to emphasize that the government and the president clearly uh, understand that this country cannot be prosperous, having poor and uh, uh, frustrated uh, neighbors along its borders. So uh, we always extending our helping hand to our neighbors. We are telling them only united, only integrated, we can withstand and face all these challenges that uh, exist in this region. What kind of challenges are you facing? Well, you know that uh, one of the greatest challenges in this part of the world is uh, Afghanistan, which has continued to be a source of uh, instability in the region. Unfortunately, uh, still uh, uh, situation is not safe in this country. From the very beginning, we supported the counterterrorism efforts of the International Coalition and we joined the International Coalition uh, and we helped, we provided the uh, airspace for coalition forces. We provided our uh, railroads and roads for transit and uh, we continue to cooperate with the uh, uh, international community to uh, help Afghanistan to become a stable state. Afghanistan is our main neighbor and Afghanistan sooner or later uh, should become a peaceful, peace-loving country with a stable society and uh, developing economy. And, uh, and I think that uh, it is achievable. We are an optimist and uh, we know it's not easy. It might take years to uh, achieve, but uh, in any case, I think that uh, what is important, what I'm re and I'm repeating again, that uh, much uh, will depend on the joint efforts of all the countries in the region to help Afghanistan government and people to stabilize the situation in that country. Tell me a little bit about the importance of the relationship between Kazakhstan and the United States. Well, uh, first, uh, the United States, as I said in my uh, opening remarks, that is uh, the country that provided us great support to get rid of the nuclear weaponry and the famous non lugar program which was called the uh, cooperative threat reduction program program uh, worked well here in kazakhstan for many years and uh, and i frankly speaking frankly saying i, I could uh, tell that uh, this program was a real success in kazakhstan mm -hmm. so the all missiles were dismantled warheads has been removed and the, the, the fuel, the nuclear uh, fuel has been uh, transformed into the peaceful purposes. That is a great achievement uh, of, of, of many years of cooperation between the United States and Kazakhstan. People might not know that when the Soviet Union controlled the area, it was in Kazakhstan that they tested all of their nuclear weaponry and this was kind of their headquarters, huh? So what the president did uh, even before independence was to say this must go, huh? Absolutely, it was a courageous decision made by the president Nazarbayev uh, at the beginning of independence while he, by his decree, mm -hmm. uh, decisively closed the uh, testing uh, site in Kazakhstan and uh, the size of this testing site, I tell you, uh, quite, quite impressive. It mm -hmm. is about 300,000 square kilometers, mm -hmm. which is about roughly the half of the size of France. Oh. And uh, <clears throat> there were about 500 nuclear explosions, 120 of them in the atmosphere. Uh, you know that, and uh, uh, many of them underground explosions. And uh, in 1991, it was uh, closed forever. And uh, uh, we had just last week an important conference, which was uh, called the 
world free of nuclear weapons, uh, dedicated to the 20th anniversary of the closure of Tsim Palatin's nuclear testing polygon, and which was attended by many uh, delegates, including the Director General of the IEA and Executive Secretary of the Comprehensive uh, nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization, a very impressive U.S. delegation headed by uh, Mr. Poneman, the Deputy Secretary of Energy, and, uh, and uh, Senator Brownback, mm -hmm. many others. <coughs> uh, so that shows that uh, uh, Kazakhstan played an important role 20 years ago by making this courageous decision and is continuing to play an important role in the world. I tell you that uh, during the Cold War, uh, around 1,400 nuclear warheads were deployed in Kazakhstan, mm -hmm. and about 1,200 intercontinental ballistic missiles. All 95% of the nuclear warheads were targeted to the major cities of continental United States. Mm. So by getting rid of that uh, weaponry and warheads, we are telling to our American partners that now they can sleep safer mm -hmm. without uh, knowing that, uh, that uh, somewhere in the world their houses being targeted by the nuclear weaponry. So I think it was a serious and enormous contribution to the peace and security in the world. When we speak about Kazakhstan, we had the fourth largest nuclear arsenal in the world, which was larger than the arsenal of UK, France and China combined. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, I think that it, had this, that say, it says for itself. Mm. As the foreign minister, when you look at the world today, what do you see? Well, it is <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of things happening now in the world. Uh, we, since the beginning of this year, we've seen the events in North Africa and the Middle East. And uh, there are many uh, problems related to the economic and financial issues. There are many uh, predictions about the next wave of crisis that we are facing, and so on and so forth. Plus natural disasters, Tehnogen problems, and other things like that. So uh, the world became more inter interdependent, uh, and countries became more interdependent on each other. So I think that we became closer to each other. Uh, an important uh, uh, issue is that, uh, that this month, the end of this, this month, somewhere in the world, the seventh billion child will be born in, the, in this planet. So we will reach the seventh billion, seven billion population in the planet. It is a lot of people and uh, uh, we have to care about every person in this planet. We have to create more zones free of nuclear weaponry. We have to uh, think about fresh water that should be enough for this amount of population. We have to think about food security. We have to think about regional conflicts uh, in different parts of the world. And we have to think about uh, prosperous development of of ordinary people in every country. And unfortunately, uh, uh, the so-called Millennium Development Goals will not be achieved by 2015, mm -hmm. but 2015 is not the end of the world. We have to think what will, will happen next. And we're already thinking about that now. And another important issue that we're also dealing with is the the environment. We have to protect the environment. We have to, have to protect the, uh, our planet from uh, different existing problems, including the um, climate change. And, uh, and I think that uh, Kazakhstan is ready to work with all the countries in the, in the world 
we are lucky we don't have any enemies we don't we we uh, manage to preserve stable and friendly the relation relations with the most countries in the world and we certainly would like to continue and expand our cooperation with the biggest country with the biggest power which is the United States of America minister thank, thank you. you so much thank you very much Special thanks to the Rixus Hotels in Kazakhstan and the Embassy of Kazakhstan in Washington. For information about my new book, The Chance of a Lifetime, and online video for all This Is America programs, visit our website, thisisamerica.net. This Is America is made possible by the National Education Association, the nation's largest advocate for children and public education. The American Federation of Teachers, a union of professionals. Poonsan Corporation, Forging a higher global standard. The CTC Foundation, AFO Communications, and the Rotondaro Family Trust. <laughs>